I'm Jeff Clements, CEO of American Promise. Uh, and I want to give a special shout out today. Our entire American Promise staff team is here in Boston from every region of the country for our uh, planning summit as 2024 is coming and we have a big year ahead. So hello to the whole American Promise team. Um, and we are so happy to have with us Trevor Potter uh, from the Campaign Legal Center, founder and president of that amazing organization. And I'll give Trevor more uh, introduction in just a minute. I wanted to um, say a little bit about, uh, as, as most folks know, American Promise was founded about five years ago to unite Americans uh, behind what uh, three out of four, maybe four out of five Americans say is the number one threat to American constitutional democracy and representative self-government. They identify money in politics and the corruption that it has caused as that. Um, and about the same number support American promises for our freedom constitutional amendment to do something about it. We're going to unpack the constitutional issues tonight around that, why we need an amendment, why can't we just pass a law and fix this problem once and for all. Um, hint, the Supreme Court for the last 50 years has been deciding a lot of cases that have made that extremely difficult. Nobody knows more about those cases than Trevor Potter. So you are in the right place if you want to learn how to fix the number one threat to American democracy. Um, but first, let me just recap a couple of things as we do each quarter. This is the American Promise National Speaker Series. We talk with uh, great thinkers, doers, innovators in, uh, in the American um, work right now, whether civic, political, social renewal. Um, last uh, quarter, we had a wonderful conversation, you may recall, with Shailen Romney Garrett. Um, and this, this quarter, of course, we have Trevor Potter, as I mentioned. Um, come back the next quarter in the new year, for sure. We will continue this series. People have really appreciated it. Um, and so uh, I want to give a quick recap. Since we talked last in March, um, a lot of things have happened with American Promise and, of course, with the country. Um, I'm going to focus on some of the good ones, and then we'll talk about some of the tougher ones with Trevor. Uh, but we won a ballot initiative in November. You heard about the work in Maine, 86% um, vote of Maine people to prohibit foreign government influence spending in Maine's elections and to advance the For Our Freedom Constitutional Amendment. We worked with the Campaign Legal Center on that. We we're very glad about that. And we'll have a lot more to say uh, as there's breaking news about that today. But a big 86% win. American Promise is growing big time. We hired state managers in Arizona, in Wisconsin, in Pennsylvania, in Maine, in Arizona. There's more to come. We welcome Jim Dornan to the team, our Congressional uh, Affairs Director in Washington, because uh, we'll need two thirds of Congress to vote this amendment out. We're closing in on that and we intend to get there. Um, and then we uh, worked with the American Bar Association. You may know about the ABA Task Force on Democracy. Trevor Potter is on the Advisory Council. Uh, we were invited to submit a paper about that. Uh, my friend in American Promise, Wisconsin, State manager now, Alan La Police will put that working paper that we submitted into the chat. Copy the links in the chat for later because you want to hear the conversation, but it'll be a really good recap of how we got here over the past 50 years and, and some um, constitutional uh, uh, principles that we can reset with this constitutional amendment. So um, we also released a report very relevant to tonight's conversation about foreign money in elections. It was covered by Politico. It unpacked the hundreds of millions of dollars that have been spent by foreign influenced organizations um, in America's elections. A hundred million in the state of Maine in the last three years alone. Um, and that came on top of a $200 million Senate race for Susan Collins' uh, re-election, about $100 million on each side in the state of Maine in, in 2020. That, sadly, is normal in Senate races now. Most of the money coming from a few zip codes, relatively speaking, outside of the state. And Mainers did something about it. A cross-partisan effort led by Republican Senator Rick Bennett, joined by Democratic Senator Nicole Grahowski and thousands of Mainers, Democrats, Republicans, Independents joined together um, and 
pushed real hard, led by Caitlin LaCase, our American Promise Executive uh, Deputy Executive Director, and got a um, amazing victory after victory passed the state legislature to prohibit foreign money in Maine's elections, um, passed, uh, uh, the governor vetoed that, came back, passed it again, the governor vetoed that, 600 volunteers got 80,000 signatures, put it up on the ballot so the Maine people could decide this issue, and won, as I said, in November with an 86% vote uh, to prohibit foreign government influence uh, organizations spending money in Maine's elections, and advancing the constitutional amendment that will fix this once and for all. Now, we just heard literally minutes ago uh, that those who want to continue to have this out of control money and corruption in our system have filed a lawsuit in the state of Maine for saying that despite the 86% vote, they claim that it violates the First Amendment and somehow foreign government influenced organizations have a constitutional right to spend unlimited money in our elections. That's the claim, folks. That's the claim that 86% of Mainers, and I'd say 86% and maybe many more Americans say is ridiculous. And we're gonna talk with Trevor Potter now about how in the world America came to a place where no matter what Americans think, foreign government influence, big super PACs, big unions, big corporations, global interests, billionaires, you name it, can just run roughshod over what most Americans want to say and spend unlimited money in elections. So with that, let me introduce my friend Trevor Potter, president of the Campaign Legal Center, uh, a former chairman of the Federal Election Commission. Uh, he's going to tell us more about that. Counsel and close advisor with Senator John McCain, including on the presidential runs. Um, counsel and work with uh, President George Bush, Herbert Walker Bush. Um, we will talk to him more about that. And every lawyer's dream, I can attest, to be included in IMDb for his uh, star appearances in movies and on television, uh, Trevor Potter uh, educated an awful lot of Americans about the consequences of the Citizens United decision when he appeared on the Colbert Report uh, not long after the decision to unpack and show just how dangerous uh, so many loopholes the court had opened up to money in elections. We now know he was absolutely right, looking back, and we see the consequences. He starred in Jon Stewart's, oh, maybe star is a little strong, but he appeared in Jon Stewart's film, uh, Irresistible and Dark Money. And uh, I would say my favorite claim to fame for Trevor Potter, he serves on the American Promise Advisory Council. And we are very grateful for that. Trevor, welcome to this conversation. Thank you for everything you do. And uh, let's just dive in and tell us a little bit about um, how how you got here. Why'd you go to law school? What, wh how, did, how did this illustrious career unfold? Well, thanks, Jeff. It's really great to be with you and have this conversation. Uh, and it's been a, a great privilege to work with American Promise Campaign Legal Center uh, was uh, really honored to be able to work with you on the main initiative and, and play a small part in thinking those issues through. That's what we do at, at CLC all over the country, working with uh, groups on citizen initiatives, uh, trying to push back uh, the wave of money and, and uh, figure out how to deal with the sorts of issues that uh, we're gonna talk about today. Uh, ironically, uh, I headed off to law school because of a foreign experience I had. Uh, I spent a year teaching school uh, in England after college. And uh, I'd studied history in college, um, had the uh, misimpression I could teach almost anything, uh, got over there and found that, that uh, the area they wanted me to talk about was uh, American history, uh, the Constitution, our system of government, how it differed from what the British had. And so uh, I spent a lot of time uh, explaining that, which required me to do a lot more uh, reading than I had done in college. And I came out of it really feeling that our Constitution, our representative system of government um, was fascinating and something uh, that I wish I knew more about. And the, 
as I talk through the, the issues uh, in this country of federalism, uh, of citizens' rights, indeed of, of the First Amendment, and got a sense of how we differed in some ways uh, from England with no written constitution and a, a, a monarchy and a parliamentary majority that can do pretty much whatever it wants and didn't have a Supreme Court. I was fascinated by how we had developed the way we did uh, and how we uh, evolved. Uh, and all of that led to, to thoughts of law school. So I ended up at the University of Virginia Law School which I loved. I'd spent uh, a number of years in, in New England. I grew up in Chicago, but had gone to school and college uh, in Massachusetts. And um, Virginia was a very different uh, part of the world. Uh, it's a great law school. I really enjoyed the experience I had there. Uh, and from that came up to Washington, uh, thinking I'd spend a year or two. As my father used to say, I got Potomac fever. Uh, and uh, found I, I, I found this the whole aspect of how our government functions absolutely fascinating. So I worked for a while at the Justice Department uh, and uh, then at a, a law firm uh, and then uh, ended up uh, very serendipitously uh, involved as a lawyer for the first President uh, Bush's campaign. Um, people say, well, how did your career develop? How did you end up? Um, focusing on election law and money and politics. Um, part of the answer is uh, that I find it really interesting and I find it uh, exciting and important. But the other part of the answer is I just got lucky. Uh, I was in the right place at the right time when the Bush campaign uh, needed a, a, a lawyer to join their team. And so I did that through uh, that whole 1985 to 88 uh, campaign process. Uh, working on the campaign and uh, in the primary system where I had a front row seat uh, to opponents who were breaking the law. President Bush was a very honorable person. His uh, campaign chair, uh, Jim Baker, was determined we were going to follow the law. And other campaigns weren't as careful or as honorable. So I kept watching, in particular, the Pat Robertson campaign which is probably as blatant an example as we've had of uh, a candidate breaking the rules. He, he, as you may recall, headed the Christian Broadcast Network, uh, and he managed to run much of his campaign out of that charitable nonprofit that's prohibited from participating in politics, uh, flying around on the uh, plane uh, belonging to the nonprofit, uh, and engaging in all sorts of things that I thought were wrong. And I sat there watching them occur and filing complaints at the Federal Election Commission about them and observing that nothing happened in response. Uh, he kept doing it. The, the commission process was a very long one. And um, I was uh, puzzled and disturbed by what I was seeing as a, a lawyer for the, the campaign. Yeah. Um, and so you uh, in for a dime, in for a dollar, I guess, President Bush then appoints you to the Federal Election Commission so you can actually try to enforce the law uh, better. What was that like? Well, that that was my goal. Um, after Bush had won, he's the only presidential candidate I've worked for who actually made it all the way to the White House. Um, one of the benefits of that is that I knew the people who were then uh, in the White House. And so they called and said, would you be interested in a job in the administration? And if so, what? Uh, and based on my experience on the campaign and, and concerns I had about the inaction of the Federal Election Commission, I said, well, there's a vacancy on the FEC and I would that, that would be uh, of real interest. And memorably, they said, you're kidding. You take that? <laughs> and that was because the FEC was seen as really a backwater um, of people who uh, really were representatives of, of the parties. Uh, they saw their job as defending their side um, and, and making sure that um, 
that the commission was fair, but it really, it didn't do much and was famous for being very slow. And so my view was, surely there ought to be ways to improve this. I guess I was young enough and naive enough uh, to, to think that I could change the, the course. And, and to some extent, we succeeded. Uh, I liked my fellow commissioners. They were willing to look at a number of the questions I raised about why things took so long. One of the things the commission did was to treat all cases the same, whether it was an allegation of a multi-million dollar violation uh, by, say, a corporation, or whether it was a candidate who filed a report five days late, and that they treated them with the same priority because their view was, well, we don't want to uh, be picking winners and losers or be seen to be partisan. So I worked with the staff. We came up with a way of rating cases and deciding based on the amount of money involved and the type of violation, whether it should have priority or whether it was something that could just basically be solved, which we created a, a what we called a, a traffic ticket system where if you filed a report late or missed something, uh, there was a set fine. So we tried to get the commission to prioritize its cases. Uh, I think we, we succeeded and cleared out a lot of the bat backlog by the end of my term. The way the FEC works, you become a commissioner and then eventually chair. So I had a year as chair of the commission. And in those days, I, I think the, the commission generally functioned as Congress intended, which is to say the Republican and Democratic commissioners made sure that it didn't become a partisan entity, that it fairly treated uh, all candidates and that no one side used it as a weapon against the other. But the difference between the commission when I was on it and the commission in the last 10 years or so is that we all believed in the job of the agency. The question was how to get it to do it better, how to be more efficient, and we were able to make progress on that. But since then, we've ended up uh, with a, a very different split on the commission where it's not so much Republican and Democratic as it is Democratic commissioners seeking to enforce the law and a block of Republican commissioners uh, whose view has been the commission would be better if it did less uh, and it has not been willing to enforce even basic aspects of the law like uh, disclosure of the sources of campaign spending uh, or to enforce the rules against coordination by outside political committees and candidates, which became really crucial uh, aspects of the law uh, after uh, the Citizens United case and the arrival of super PACs and uh, all the corporate spending that we've seen that's supposed to be independent of campaigns, but the reality is often is not. And the FEC is... is uh, missing in action on most of those. They deadlock. There are three Republican commissioners, three Democratic. And if they can't come up with a four vote majority, they can't do anything. They don't decide a case. They just dismiss it. Yeah. And one of the things the uh, Campaign Legal Center has been doing uh, for the 20 years since it's founded has been suing the FEC, uh, trying to get, force them to enforce the law. Uh, with with some success, but if we, you know, it's crazy to have to go to court to get a court decision, ordering the commission to do what it should have done in the first place, then sometimes they still don't do it. We have to go back to court, get the court to, to say you failed to do what we ordered you to, and try it all over again. But that's a mainstay of our campaign finance practice, because the commission is not doing what it should. Yeah, let's unpack the commission a little bit, because... Um... Partly it's not doing what it should. Partly it can't do much in a lot of areas. Americans would like to see more law enforcement because of Supreme Court decisions. And I and I I want to make sure our audience um, is is um, gets the benefit of your experience over these um, past decades in terms of some of the Supreme Court campaign finance cases, both state and and federal. Um, there is a question about what does the you know why? Why a constitutional amendment will have no real world impact? I, I, you know, obviously, American promise, and 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 we don't think that. I think if you can appreciate how the Supreme Court has dismantled 
the rights of Americans to actually enact effective anti-corruption laws about money and politics, you'll appreciate why a constitutional amendment is necessary. So let's go back. The Federal Election Commission that um, you served so ably on, Trevor, was created after Watergate, part of the Federal Election Campaign Act, um, the Watergate scandal in the 1970s. President Nixon resigned. Congress um, and, and, and several um, people went to jail for violating um, federal law, um, several corporations prosecuted. None of them actually raised any First Amendment objection to the prosecution. Um, Congress passes a, a comprehensive anti-corruption law, um, creating much of what began, became the federal um, campaign system with limits on contributions, limits on PACs, um, the creation of the Federal Election Commission, much else. Um, limits on spending by campaigns entirely, as many countries do. And it goes to the Supreme Court in a case called Buckley versus Vallejo. Now, this is 19, early 1970s. We've been a republic for 200 years by that point. The Supreme Court had never once struck down an anti-corruption law under a theory that the First Amendment, freedom of speech, prevented um, any limitations on money in politics. We had the Tillman Act, we had Taft-Hartley, we had limits on corporate money, limits on union money, limits on individual spending in many states and federally. Not once had the Supreme Court decided it was its job to decide the campaign finance rules. That was for Congress and the states under the Constitution. But then Buckley versus Vallejo, first time in history, the Supreme Court says Congress and the states are limited by a notion that money spending money is like free speech. So that's my sort of intro to Buckley versus Vallejo, um, which which is now 50 years old, um, but has been sort of um, creating reverberations through our constitutional system ever since, including right down to Citizens United versus Federal Election Commission, the much more famous case these days. But tell us um, what you're thinking about Buckley. And, you know, it was uh, before, uh, I think, either of us were in law school. Um, I'm not sure it was taught much uh, considering its consequences. Uh, what was your experience um, with the case, um, at least maybe before you became President Bush's counsel during the campaign, but then but then afterwards? Could you tell us a little bit about Buckley. Well, I think you're absolutely right that um, there, Congress had passed a number of laws regulating money in politics, banning corporate spending, regulating union spending, uh, and, and those had been upheld without uh, a view that they violated the, the First Amendment. So the, the Buckley case uh, was, in some ways, uh, the font of everything that has flowed since then, because the court looked at it, uh, it upheld portions of it, uh, the limits on contributions to candidates, because it said those could be corrupting, and the limits on contributions to party committees. There was not a challenge to the pre-existing ban at the time on corporate money. That, that was already law, so that wasn't new, and the court didn't deal with it there. But the court came up with this theory uh, that the First Amendment right to speak involved the right to make, to spend unlimited money in order to speak, which is a different issue. Uh, you, know, you have a First Amendment um, at a time when people stood on street corners and shouted or they wrote letters uh, or they owned newspapers, which is covered by a different aspect of the First Amendment, the freedom of the press. So the, the thought that the government was prohibited by the First Amendment from limiting the amount of money that a campaign could spend or a candidate could spend themselves uh, was something that the court had not declared before in that format. Uh, in doing so, the court had, there was another piece of that that I think has had uh, long lasting and dangerous consequences, which is the court said, it is not the business of Congress, meaning it is unconstitutional. Congress does not have the right to try to set up an election system that is fair 
an election system where everyone can be heard, an even playing field where both candidates or all candidates would have the same amount of speech. The court said all of those are wrong. They are not legitimate governmental uh, goals. The only governmental goal that the court allowed as a restriction on money in politics is what they then said was to prevent corruption and the appearance of corruption, because that's what we'd had directly in Watergate. Now, one of the objections to Watergate was that literally millions of dollars had flowed into the Nixon reelection campaign and the RNC, uh, and they had vastly outspent the Democrats. But the court said that's irrelevant. The only thing that's relevant is whether the money coming in is corrupting or has the appearance of corruption. And I, I will say that since then, the court has gone further as uh, it has grown, um, I would say, more radical on these issues. Uh, it's taken a stronger stance. And now it never talks about the appearance of corruption. Uh, the, the court left open in Buckley the idea that vast sums would appear corrupting, even if they were relatively innocent, they were given by somebody for a good reason and not to buy an action, that other people might think it was corrupting. Since then, the court has really uh, closed that door as well. And now their view is you have to show actual quid pro corruption, virtually handing over a wad of money in return for specific governmental action. Then in other cases, they've said, even we're going to limit what governmental action is. Uh, okay. So the, the starting with Buckley, the court drew this great dichotomy between regulating contributions and regulating expenditures, and basically said the amount of money that is spent by somebody uh, cannot be limited. But, but remember, going back to my earlier comment about independent expenditures, because as long as it's independent of the candidate or the party committee, it can't be corrupting. Now, you and I would, I think, disagree with that and say, where did they get the idea that spending $10 million to elect someone can't be corrupting? I mean, the person's gonna be incredibly grateful. Uh, they're gonna want you to spend that money next time. They're not going to want uh, you to oppose them with 10 million in the next election. So all of that is, I think, clearly has the danger of corruption. But the court idea was, as long as it's done independently, you can spend as much as you want as an individual. They got to corporate spending later. And th that itself uh, presents, a, a, I think, a real problem uh, for our democracy. But it relies on this idea that the spending is independent. And they didn't define what independent meant. Uh, in a couple of cases, justices have said, well, it can't be done with a wink and a nod. It has to be truly independent of candidates and so forth. Um, but a lot of the spending we're seeing today that is allowed in unlimited amounts by these super PACs and these other entities is only allowed because in theory it's independent and in reality it's not independent at all. You just look at it. The groups are established by candidates. They're funded by the campaign's major donors. The fundraising is by the campaign's own fundraisers. The manager of the outside group used to work for the candidate. Uh, there is this uh, uh, cross-section of contacts all the time, which puts the lie to the whole concept under the Buckley uh, independent expenditures are okay because they're independent. Yeah, let's jump into that a little bit. And, and folks, keep your questions coming in the chat. I'm going to, I see them and I'm going to be feeding them in to Trevor Potter, our guest today. We're so glad to have Trevor with us. Um, and we're talking about how we got to a place where we have $20 billion spent in election cycles, we have 200 to $500 million Senate races, where 86% of Americans see money in politics as the most significant threat to American constitutional democracy and representative government. Um, the good news, three out of four Americans back a constitutional amendment to fix it. 
Um, one thing the amendment would do, and uh, again, it's in the chat, Alan will put it up again if you need it for our freedom amendment, um, is actually uh, enable limits on PACs. Um, so the super PAC, um, the so-called, uh, as Trevor explained, rather phony independent expenditures uh, because they're not independent. But I think, you know, there's another problem that seems to me, Trevor, with, with the super PAC and the idea that as long as it's quote unquote independent, it doesn't corrupt. And, and the Supreme Court, as you said, seems to think corruption is only defined by turning over a bag of cash directly to the candidate. When for Americans and for our founders of the country, a very different idea of corruption was systemic corruption, where a very small, powerful elite had all the power and the average person had no power. And and so this notion that, you know, just because it's independent, a global company, maybe 100 percent owned by foreign government even, can spend unlimited money because it's not going directly to the candidate and it just drowns out the voices of the voters who live there. It creates the information space. So the, the actual controlling what's available in terms of information in the election. Um, and, and that could be true, whether it's a foreign government influenced organization or a billionaire. And, and the Supreme court says, well, too bad political equality doesn't count. Um, as long as it's quote unquote independent, we can't limit that. So that wasn't always the case. And so I'd like to go back to your experience. You fast forward from your law school, you work for President Bush, you go into the Federal Election Commission, you connect with Senator John McCain, um, and you work on his presidential campaign. You also work um, very closely with him in a landmark law celebrated by most Americans, the McCain-Feingold Law, Bipartisan Campaign Reform Act, which actually had limits on PACs. Um, which said corporations and unions uh, have limits on so-called independent spending. They can do it, but there's still going to be rules about it. Um, and had other reforms. Uh, it gets upheld by the Supreme Court. Um, the Supreme Court seemed to be backing away from the Buckley idea and recognizing the danger. You had the Austin case where um, a very conservative justice, a Chief Justice Rehnquist joins with a very liberal justice, Thurgood Marshall, and saying the states have rights to uh, enact reasonable limits on, on, on the way money is used in elections. Um, you have Sandra Day O'Connor, a Republican appointee, um, joining the majority in McConnell versus Federal Election Commission to uphold your law, uh, the McCain-Feingold law that you helped work on. Um, it seemed to be getting better. Um, the constitutional amendment first introduced by Fritz Hollings in 1986, supported by John McCain along the way and many others, seemed to not be needed. The court was backing into its maybe more appropriate role and letting the Congress and the states have some room to, if, 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 um, to address these issues. And then Citizens United, and we get to where we are. Tell, walk us through your experience in that, um, from working with Senator McCain on the presidential race and McCain-Feingold to the unraveling of, of the system. Yeah, we'd gone through a period where the post-Watergate reforms, after the Supreme Court had removed the expenditure limits, and you now had candidates able to spend an unlimited amount of their own money, and they still had to raise money for their campaigns under the legal limits from other people, so you had a system that more or less worked in the 70s and 80s, but there's always what is referred to sometimes as the hydraulic pressure of money, the force of money pushing against these rules. And uh, if you don't support the rules and push back, they begin to give way. And so one of the things that happened uh, was the advent of what was then called soft money, which simply meant money that wasn't permitted in federal elections, specifically corporate money or labor money or huge individual contributions to party committees uh, because the law limited them. But the Federal Election Commission, uh, which can issue advisory opinions that then shape the law and can eventually virtually change it and undermine it, the Federal Election Commission got an advisory opinion request from an Illinois State Party Committee saying, can we raise money under Illinois law, which has no limits, 
uh, and we're an Illinois state party committee. And can we then spend it to talk about Republican candidates in general or Democratic candidates in general? Um, can we mention a federal candidate in our ad if he's endorsing uh, a state candidate? The, the idea was to find ways to get this money that was so-called non-federal money, not permitted in federal elections, in via the state parties, because they have both federal and state candidates. And the FECs generally said yes, and that morphed into not only state parties taking it, but the national committees of the two parties taking the money in a non-federal account. Uh, and the theory was they too have a non-federal role so they can take all this money. And before you could virtually blink, we had a situation where major industries seeking congressional action were being solicited by the national parties and their office holders, i.e. leaders of Congress, for large corporate contributions to go into the national party coffers, ostensibly for non-federal purposes, being spent on ads in federal races featuring federal candidates. Uh, that, that was a, say, 10, 15 year period to get there. Uh, but the FEC didn't push back hard enough. Uh, Congress didn't do anything about it. And so John McCain was the person who stepped forward with Russ Feingold and, of course, Congressman Shays and Meehan. And they said, this is supposed to be illegal. This isn't a novel concept that we don't want corporate money, special interest money, buying action in Congress with huge contributions. And we also are supposed to have full disclosure, and we don't have that. So McCain-Feingold, in a way, was simply a repair job. It was trying to put the system back where it had been after Watergate with the limits in force and not have these huge contributions to national parties. And as McCain always focused on it, not having congressional leaders or the president involved in raising money from special interests that they would then be beholden to. So that was the theory of McCain-Feingold. Um, uh, I was fortunate to be one of the outside advisors, along with a range of law professors and others, who assisted in the drafting uh, to write something that we thought the Supreme Court would uphold under existing First Amendment jurisprudence. Uh, and as you point out, Justice O'Connor uh, was the key vote uh, in upholding it. It was a 5-4 decision. Senator Mitch McConnell was sure that the court was going to throw it out. Uh, but remember that Sandra Day O'Connor was the only member of the court who had served in elected office. She had been in the Arizona legislature. She had raised money. She had seen the influence of money and outside interests on legislators. And I think whatever her constitutional views were, she thought here is an instance where Congress is acting on a problem it can see and it can feel uh, on a daily basis. And so we, the court, ought to defer to Congress when they have said this is a problem and this is their proposed solution. And again, it wasn't a radical solution. It kept to the boundaries the court had already set. Uh, so as you know, they upheld it 5-4, uh, and it included a very clear ban, a restatement of the ban on corporate and union money in federal elections. So that lasted uh, until Citizens United came along, which was a direct challenge to, depending on how you count, either the 100-year or the 70-year ban on corporate money in elections, which not only was a federal ban, but a number of states had bans like that as well. Massachusetts did, um, famously Montana did, because that came up in a later case. But the challenge was that the First Amendment should protect corporate speech the same way it protects the individual speech that the court had already said couldn't be limited if it were 
independent of candidates and parties. Uh, now, the court had ruled the other way in a whole series of cases, particularly the Austin case, uh, where uh, Justice uh, Thurgood Marshall had written uh, that corporations are not people. Uh, in case you didn't notice, they don't actually have a uh, temporal body, meaning people die. Corporations are eternal. Uh, corporations raise money under different rules. Uh, they have a different tax system. Uh, they don't vote. And so the, the very basic concept that in a representative democracy, the voters are the ones who should determine who's in government, uh, Marshall said, uh, is uh, violated when you have non-voters uh, who are spending money and influencing elections directly. Now, remember that when we talk about corporations, uh, they're, in them are people chief executives, boards of directors, shareholders as individuals, and each of them already had the right as an individual to spend their own money in elections. So it isn't that corporations were being shut up. Uh, their, their humans could go ahead and speak and spend their own money. And in fact, Congress had created PACs, political action committees, where the individuals in a corporation, the shareholders and the executives could pool their money within limits and spend that also to endorse candidates because it was individual money. So corporations already had a role, uh, which I think the majority decision in Citizens United was very dishonest about in saying corporations can't speak. In fact, they could through limited means in a pact. But the Supreme Court majority found for the first time that corporations had a constitutional right to the same speech that individuals did, even though they're very differently constituted. Um, and uh, rather broadly said, you know, the, the right here is of the uh, American people to hear views from whatever source. And so Americans have this new First Amendment right to hear corporate speech, even if they don't want to, or labor speech under the Citizens United uh, decision. Uh, yeah. so it, it just changes completely what we had thought of as the First Amendment uh, landscape. Uh, and it reflected a congressional refusal, uh, unlike Sandra Day O'Connor when she was on the court, she was gone by Citizens United, to defer to Congress on something as fundamental to our democracy as how elections work. Yeah, and there's certainly, um, you referenced Sandra Day O'Connor, Justice O'Connor recently passed away. The last justice uh, who actually had any experience uh, representing voters, running for election, serving in the Arizona state legislature, um, there's a certain unreality about the Supreme Court's cases around money and politics, as we have nine people who've never actually run for anything um, so much as local office, let alone national office. And that's somewhat new in our history. Um, there's usually been a mix of justices with some real world experience. Um, and the common thing was the Supreme Court staying out of it until the late 70s or the mid 70s, as we talked about. And and now the Supreme Court has aggregated to itself, essentially, the role of chief finance, uh, campaign finance regulator, it seems to me. And basically, but, and I think that's that's you're right, that that is partly because of who's on the court. People get to the court now from academic circles, from being a judge on a district court and then a circuit court through the Federalist Society, but not through public life, not yeah. serving in legislatures, being a governor, being uh, a senator, if you look back, the court always had people who were grounded in public life on it uh, until right now. Yeah, I think that's right. So I want to go to some questions in the chat and, and we'll continue to unpack this because the questions are asking very good um, questions about the implications of Citizens United and several other cases that, as you said, Trevor struck down Montana's laws and, and 24 other states that had any corruption laws going back a century, struck down the Arizona um, public finance um, 
um, matching funds, if, um, trying to respond to super PAC, spending unlimited money. Maybe if your opponent spends a little more, you could get more matching funds. No, says the Supreme Court, um, opening up more uh, avenues in McCutcheon to wealthy people, controlling uh, and having a dominant influence in the in the um, parties through uh, aggregate contributions, federal candidates. Um, and the net result seeming to be the, the metaphor of Wild West has been perhaps overused, but there's this sense and the reality that money is coming in um, from all sorts of sources. So some questions around that. One is how are nonprofits and super PACs um, being used? How How is it that um, that the nonprofits, um, something that's supposed to be a charitable organization is actually running money into elections and covering up uh, where the money comes from in some ways. People are trying want to understand that. They want to understand how super PACs are used by foreign interests potentially, including um, some reports of foreign intelligence operations that can use um, our porous campaign finance system to put money into, into elections or foreign government owned companies that just do it outright as they did in Maine and then sue to say, you can't stop us. <laughs> so walk us through a little bit of the practicalities of this jurisprudence and what's, what's really happening. Help, help our audience understand how the breakdown because of the Supreme court's decisions has enabled so much abuse. I'm I'm happy to do that, and I'm, I'm going to put in a plug here with a smile, which is uh, if your audience would like to have some fun and get a longer answer, you should Google uh, Colbert Report and Super PACs because Stephen Colbert got a uh, Peabody News Award for explaining exactly this: how PACs and Super PACs work, uh, and how you can hide money through them. But my short answer less funny than his will be, uh, is that uh, PACs are creatures of federal law and they have to disclose all their funders and they're limited um, in who they, how much money they can take. So under Citizens United with this theory of unlimited independent expenditures by corporations and so forth, uh, courts, again, not Congress, created what we call super PACs, non-connected independent expenditure committees, technically. Uh, what it means is those PACs still report who their donors are, but they can take unlimited money uh, from individuals, corporations, unions. In theory, not foreign nationals. Uh, foreign nationals are prohibited, and we'll get to this, I know, uh, by current law from contributing to candidates or party committees. But the PACs can take unlimited money from anyone else. The anyone else can include an LLC, and who knows who owns the LLC? It can include a nonprofit. Now, your question in the chat said, but nonprofits are supposed to be charitable. They're different types of nonprofits. So a charity is a 501c. It's prohibited from participating in politics. In theory, that's hospitals, colleges, other good public works. But there are a bunch of other 501c, C4, C5, 6s, 7s, it goes way up, that are nonprofit in the sense that they're not taxed on their income, but they're not charities, so you don't get a tax deduction when you give to them. So if you are a corporation that doesn't want to be seen to spend money in an election, maybe because your shareholders don't like it, if you're a foreign entity and you know you're not supposed to spend money in an election, you can give your money to a nonprofit C4, 5, 6, one of these groups, Chambers of Commerce's are C6's. Um, nonprofits just have to be, um, they don't disclose their donors to the public. That's the other piece of this. None of these nonprofits disclose their donors. So if you follow the money, it goes into a nonprofit. It can come in those circumstances from foreign sources, businesses trying to hide their tracks, et cetera. The nonprofits give to the super PACs. The super PACs report their donors, but what are they reporting? An LLC, a C4, without any idea of where that money came from. And that then can be spent in our elections. So that's the route to that spending, and that's the concern. 
Yeah. All right. Thank you. And uh, second, the recommendation to check out the Colbert Report. Uh, and Trevor was being modest and giving all the credit to Mr. Colbert, but uh, Trevor himself is a star on that show and really unpacks it. Um, so look it up. Um, that's where the internet comes in handy. We're glad to have that available. Um, so thank you. Hey, hey, Jim has a question in the chat that I think is both timely and important. He says the media, either online or traditional, could be an ally in a constitutional amendment, but refuse to do so because many of them are financial beneficiaries of the unlimited money. Please discuss. And the reason I pulled that one out, thank you, Jim. Um, I don't know if Jim knows, but the plaintiff in the main case that was filed hours ago to block the law that 86% of Maine voters passed that prohibits foreign government influenced organizations spending money in Maine's elections and advances the constitutional amendment. One of the plaintiffs is the Maine Broadcasters Association. Yes, the media. And their argument is, um, as I understand it, that the um, law violates the First Amendment rights of, um, quote unquote, all speakers, including the plaintiff who hasn't yet had the guts to actually show up and make the claim, but we expect they will, the foreign government owned companies that the law actually applies to. So the media uh, is claiming that because the law puts a very mild obligation on them not to accept foreign government spending for their advertisements that they're gonna run in the elections, somehow the first amendment is violated. So um, it's a real question. There's been a multi-billion dollar industry effectively created over the last 10 years. And it's awfully hard to have a, a, a sort of independent media willing to maybe um, address specifically a, a, a problem that most Americans see that actually is billions of dollars of revenues to them. Do you have thoughts on Jim's question about how how the, um, the, the media, both social or otherwise, are actually financial beneficiaries of the system and, and kind of the you know, political industrial complex of operatives and super PACs and media that have, have, have become so powerful over this past decade? Well, first of all, I think you're absolutely right. There is a uh, political industrial complex out there. And you're talking about spending $20 billion. That's a lot of political consultants who have a stake in the current system. That's a lot of fundraisers who do. Uh, that's uh, a lot of media entities who are receiving billions of dollars because that's what's spent on advertising, whether it is uh, social media advertising or uh, traditional radio and television advertising. A couple of years ago, the president of CBS was uh, speaking to a group of investors, and he said, all this money being spent on politics may be terrible for democracy, but it's great for CBS. Uh, and it is. You, you look at the, the chunk of money that comes in, and they're paying top dollars. Normal advertisers uh, will say, well, I want my ad to run. I don't want to pay more than X dollars uh, for a, a segment. Uh, and they'll negotiate rates. When you're talking political advertising, you have to remember that the election occurs at a specific time in the calendar. So the advertisers don't want to be on late night when no one's watching, and they don't want to be on in June if the election is in November. So everybody wants to be on in the fall. Literally, stations run out of ad time to sell, and they charge premium rates to all of these super PACs and, and other groups. So it's a, uh, it's a, a gold mine for them. And, and that is part of the uh, political industrial complex that, that we've developed with the amount of money that's being spent. If, if you go back and look, when I first got involved in that Bush campaign in 1988, the budget of the Bush campaign was $45 million because they were, there was a presidential public funding system. The candidates took public money it, for the general election and in return promised not to raise any private money. And the parties had limited resources because the amount you could give to a party was limited. There was no corporate money in that election. Corporations and unions could only speak to their members, not to the general public. So you had a completely different world than 
what we're looking at today. Yeah, and I think for um, for those of us who were there, um, I, I don't recall anyone feeling like their speech was limited. I recall, you know, vigorous debates and 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 lots of information for voters. Um, so this notion that somehow now we have quote unquote more free speech because we have a lot more money, look around. I don't think most Americans feel like um, they're able to speak more or that the our debate has somehow been uh, enlivened and and we're able to discuss issues in some deeper way now. Um, a lot of the spending seems to feed the division machine that tears well, us apart. It, 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 absolutely, it does, because uh, candidates, when they're speaking, uh, tend to be positive, forward-looking, a little careful what they say, because voters don't like angry, mean candidates who are out there trashing people, generally. Uh, but... All these independent expenditures aren't tied uh, specifically uh, and aren't the responsibility of a candidate. So they're almost 95% negative. And so what people are hearing is the other person is terrible. And you end up in a situation where people think they're voting for the lesser of two evils, but still evil. And that is because of the unlimited uh, so-called outside spending rather than the the spending and the speech by the candidates themselves. So it tears down our system uh, as a byproduct of this theory of unlimited independent speech. Yeah, and it's no longer just the federal elections. It's now state. It's now, you mentioned the advertising. Um, I have a, 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 a the district attorney uh, in, in a county in Maine um, got, uh, you know, district attorney's races were usually 10,000, maybe 25,000. <laughs> Uh, a single billionaire spent four hundred thousand dollars trying to attack and and remove this district attorney, and they were advertising during the Celtics playoffs. And if you're from New England, you know a that reaches a lot of people, and b it's expensive. And they spent four hundred thousand dollars to defeat this independent district attorney. So it's coming to school committees, it's coming to district attorneys' races, you name it. And so when you see that, you need to understand the effect of that on our democracy and our culture, because normal people say, I can't afford to run for office. Yeah. Um, I have a friend who, who was a very prominent mayor who said, I'm not going to run for re-election because I can't afford, I can't justify spending two and a half or three million dollars of my own money uh, and mortgaging the future to do this, because that's what it'll take. And if, if you're seeing that sort of money in a in a main DA race, uh, if you don't have money, you're not going to have an opportunity to serve in in government, which it seems to me is very un-American, contrary to our, our traditions. And the people who have money will be running those uh, campaigns and dictating results, even if they're from out of state. That's yeah, another or... big problem we have is that the money that is being spent in many, many races has nothing to do with the state. If we're a representative system, you would think the local voters would be the speakers. But the speakers are 70, 80, 90 percent in some of these races uh, from the other side of the country with no connection to the state. But they want to try to dictate the result of a local election and who's going to represent that state in Congress. That's right. And as David in the chat says, that's not the way a republic is supposed to work, where local uh, actually matters and states actually matter. So thank you, David, for that comment. And we're going to have to wrap there, but there's one more piece of breaking news. Um, the foreign-owned corporations actually did file a lawsuit while we were talking in the state of Maine to block the law passed by 86% of Mainers. Um, that would have pro prohibited and will prohibit foreign money in Maine's elections and advance this constitutional amendment to fix this out of control corruption problem. The state of Maine, um, we are advised, and the attorney general there intends to defend that vigorously. I'm sure campaign finance, uh, campaign legal center, uh, Trevor Potter's organization, and American Promise will be right there with the people of Maine to defend the law that they so worked so hard for against this attack. Um, if you want to join the fight, whether in Maine or around the country, go to AmericanPromise.net and you can get involved in the effort for a constitutional solution to this problem. Check out Campaign Legal Center and we'll get these URLs in the chat. 
as well and see Trevor's great work, um, the lawyers uh, for our republic in many ways. We're glad to, so glad to work with Campaign Legal Center. Um, but folks, you, you're hearing this tonight. We know it. We got to fix this. There is no fix without a constitutional amendment that corrects the Supreme Court's misguided um, uh, cases that have gotten us into this mess. But we're confident, um, Republican, Democrat, independent, around the country, Americans agree on this. They're uniting, and we're going to get it fixed. Trevor Potter, thank you so much for joining us tonight. We really appreciate this conversation and all your great work. Thank you, Jeff, and thank you for everything you and American promised to. All right. We'll see you soon. Bye, everybody. Thank you for joining us.